There's a passage in the canon where a group of monks are going off to a distant land to go take leave of the Buddha, and he tells them to take leave of Sariputta. So they go to see Sariputta, and he asks them, when you go to this distant land and people ask you, what does your teacher teach? How are you going to answer them? And so the monks asked Sariputta what would be a good answer to give. And the first answer he gives is, our teacher teaches dispassion. And he goes on to say, if the people are intelligent, then they will ask dispassion for what? Which shows a big difference right there between people in that time and people in our time. Most people, when they hear the word dispassion, they lose interest immediately. They don't care about what you might be having dispassion for. The idea that dispassion would come first is something that's not all that appealing. But for intelligent people, Sar Sarabuddha says, you say it's dispassion for the aggregates. And then the next question would be, what advantage do you see? Or what advantage does your teacher see in having dispassion for the aggregates? And he says, when they change, you don't suffer. But it's interesting that dispassion is the first thing he comes up with. The Buddha himself at one point says, dispassion is the highest of all dhammas, of all phenomena. The Eightfold Path is the highest of fabricated phenomena, but dispassion is unfabricated. And it's the highest experience you can have. Now here again, the idea that dispassion would be better than anything else you might know sounds very strange. The forest Johns talk about this a lot. They say it's it's like sobering up after you've been drunk. When you're drunk, you don't see things clearly. It's when you sober up that you finally see things clearly, and the mind is freed from all the confusion and fogginess of being drunk. And John Lee compares it to having been eating something and finally realize you don't want to eat it anymore. This is very closely associated with disenchantment, which goes together with dispassion. He says you spit things out. What do you spit out? Of course, it's the five aggregates. You've been feeding on them. That's what clinging means. You've been feeding on them. And for most of us, the, the only pleasure we know in life is satisfying our hungers by feeding. So the idea of going beyond feeding requires an act of the imagination to appreciate that this really could be a good thing. But you look at the nature of feeding. One, it's oppressive to the things fed on, and two, it's oppressive for the person who needs to feed. The alternative, of course, is not to starve, which as most of us think is the alternative. It's to find a part of the mind that doesn't need to feed, and dispassion is what leads us there. It's related to all the all the noble truths. And the Buddha says with the, our duty with regard to the first noble truth is to comprehend it. And then another sutta he answers the question, what does it mean to comprehend? It means to understand it to the point of dispassion. You realize that you've been feeding off form and feelings and perceptions and fabrications and consciousness. All these things that make up your sense of who you are. And then you found something better. And so you don't need to feed anymore. And you realize that all of this clinging and holding on is suffering. Similarly with the second noble truth, the origination of suffering. You try to develop dispassion for it so you can abandon it. The third noble truth is dispassion itself. The only truth that involves some passion is the path. You've got to have some passion to do it. It's something you have to put together, something you construct. You have to want to do it well. Or than say basically means giving your whole heart to it. But there does come a point where the path is complete. And you have to let go of that too. You have to develop some dispassion for the path. So dispassion weaves its way throughout the teachings. This is why when the Buddha said, the 
best way to show homage to him is to practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. And then he went on to say in another spot, what does it mean to do that? It means to practice for the sake of dispassion. You can also interpret it as meaning not change in the Dharma from what the Buddha taught to suit yourself. You have to change yourself in order to suit the Dharma, which means that you have to think about dispassion in a good way. As the Buddha said, if you think of nirvana, dispassion, all these other things as suffering, one, you're wrong, and two, it's going to be hard to practice. So learn to see these things, as the Buddha says. See renunciation as rest. See renunciation as a true way of finding peace in the mind. And again, we don't give up the feeding just by starving. We give up feeding because we find something in the mind that doesn't need to feed. This is one of the reasons why awakening happens in stages. You have your first taste of the deathless with your first taste of awakening. It doesn't end all passion, but it does let you know there is something better and there is a part of the mind that doesn't need to feed. And that's basically when you're won over. So when the chance comes to finally let go totally, you're ready for it. So this is why practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma is a factor of stream entry. It's something that you work on. Try to see it as something positive, dispassion, as true freedom. That gives you motivation. It's funny, this passion for the path has to be motivated by seeing that passion, dispassion would be something good. But again, there are a lot of paradoxes in the path things you have to develop that you will eventually have to let go of. So if a passion to want to grow up, to stop feeding on the things you used to feed on. When I was a child, I used to save up my money to buy Hostess cupcakes. It was pure garbage. And now that I see it's pure garbage, I'm, I'm glad I'm not eating Hostess cupcakes anymore. You can probably think of the things you ate as a child that would make you would find disgusting now. Well, that's basically how awakened people feel about the things they fed on before. It's through distorted perceptions. And when you get your perceptions right, it's not a depression. This is one of the big misunderstandings about this passion. There was a study that was done a while back about descriptions of people who were really into the Dharma in Sri Lanka. And they came up with the conclusion that a lot of these people were suffering from clinical depression, saying that nothing in the world was any good and there was no need to, or no reason to want to accomplish anything at all. Well, that's not the kind of dispassion the Buddha is talking about. It requires passion for the path, because we're finding something that really is good, something really is better. So learn to see dispassion in a good light, and realize that even though it is the highest of all dhammas, there's something higher still, which is nirvana, as the ending of dhammas. And Chan Mun makes this point. He says the Third Noble Truth is not the final step, it's the step that leads to nirvana. There's something that you have to do with regard to it, and nirvana is something you don't have to do at all. Dispassion is something you move toward, that you create the conditions for in the mind. And John Lee describes it as the point where finally the, the fabricated and the unfabricated make a total break. At that point, the mind is beyond all dramas. It's totally free. But dispassion is the portal that that should go there, because we've been feeding on these things for so long. And we have to learn that there's something better, and we have to see the feeding itself as something that's a burden for the mind. So try to get your views straight, that when the Buddha says that the cessation of suffering is dispassion.
learn to see that as a good thing. And use that to give yourself some passion for the path. And John Fuang used to say, if you want to get good at meditation, you have to be crazy about it. You have to keep at it. Every little sliver of time you might find to stay with the breath, you do that. Keep at it. Keep at it. So develop passion for the goal of dispassion. And then ultimately you use dispassion to get to a point where the mind is beyond both. The freedom the Buddha is talking about is that total. And if we work in this direction, then we're practicing the Dharma in line with the Buddha's intentions for why he taught the Dharma and why he wanted people to practice it. That's how we honor his teaching. That's how we do honor to our own desire for true happiness.